thank you all for coming, despite the weather. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, quickly uh, both speakers to do about seven or eight minutes of a sort of position statement. David Vivas is going to go first, and then Shashi Tharoor is going to follow. Um, so I want them to speak for seven or eight minutes. Then we're going to have a bit of an exchange, and then I want to throw it over to you, because I imagine this is going to be a big, big conversation that we want to have about empire, okay? So we'll get to you as quickly as possible, because I think you'd like that. So, without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to David Vivas. He's going to talk for a bit, and then we'll hear from Shashi. David. I don't need eight minutes. Two words, British bad. I think, are we done? Any and we can agree and go home. <laughs> David, you peaked too early. I peaked too early. Sorry about that. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Shashi, for joining us. Uh, thanks, everyone, for trekking out in the rain. Uh, I, I, I left my umbrella in the UK. I'm really disappointed, but that's fine. We'll, we'll hold the British. You're not supposed to need one in Jaipur, no, okay, actually. Okay, all right. The British should have blamed for that as well. And I was caught in the rain earlier, and, and, and I was running out of the bookshop, and I was trying to find shelter, and the only place was the American Embassy. What? And I'm wearing a Palestinian flag, and I thought, oh, Christ. Viva. I, <laughs> Viva. I thought, Sha Viva. I've got principles, but I also really wanted to get dry, so I did go in. Long story short, uh, they recruited me to the US Army, and right at the time, they're starting a war in the Middle East. Anyway, uh, I, they, Two you know, guilty white how often do you share know. a stage with these people? And I've wasted it on a joke. Bah. My wife's at home. She's, you know, she's angry. Right, so... Um, um, I mean, it's, oh, it's a real privilege. I can't say for, for someone like me to be next to Shashi Through. Not so much Jerry. Um, and um, his work's fantastic, and I've loved his work. He's great at looking at, um, uh, at the way Britain occupied and exploited um, uh, Britain in a sort of later kind of context of sort of the later 18th, 19th, 20th century. So I'm going to kind of bookend that at the beginning with the kind of emergence of the, the British Empire. Um, and looking at the ways that, uh, yes, Britain, you know, uh, uh, oppressed uh, uh, and caused atrocities and exploited and looted, um, but also to kind of recenter indigenous and, and non-European people as, yes, victims, of course, uh, but also as serious actors in their own right, capable of resisting the British Empire, uh, having resilient cultures and dynamic economies and powerful political systems that were not as easily overthrown as perhaps we're often led to believe in the literature. And I think that uh, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the British Empire, the very first colony of the English was Ireland. But Ireland, you know, we have this sense of Ireland as being kind of the eternal colony. The people were always oppressed. But the English colonization of Ireland starts in the 12th century with the Normans, goes all the way through to the 16th century, um, and it almost pushes the English to, state to the brink of collapse. There's a spectacular war, the Nine Years' War, that lasts for 10 years, obviously, um, and um, it costs the English Treasury £2 million, 100,000 lives. It's more damaging to the English than the war with Spain and in the Netherlands combined in this century. Um, and even with the conquest of Ireland after centuries and centuries, uh, the Irish refused to uh, uh, um, become subordinate, and they're constantly challenging the English. Uh, and so... Um, one English uh, lawyer in the uh, mid-17th century uh, uh, calls it the unfinished conquest. Um, and so it starts with Ireland. The people involved in the colonization of Ireland go over to North America and the Caribbean. And it's a similar story there. We think of the indigenous Native Americans have been kind of wiped out by disease, displaced, and they essentially disappear uh, from the historical record uh, and our more modern histories. But things like in Virginia, when the English set up the first colony at Jamestown. It takes over half a century to dismantle the hegemony of the Powhatan chiefdom. It takes multiple wars. Um, and, and even there, there are pockets of indigenous power that survive well into the 19th century. Um, and in the Caribbean, it's a similar story. We think of the Caribbean as the crucible of empire, of sugar, of slavery, the profits that underwrote the Atlantic trade that made Britain and France and others global powers. And that is part of the story. But the other half of the story is the indigenous Kalanago people who lived there that were able to resist and, and force the English and French through multiple wars into partitioning the Caribbean for over 100 years. So you had an independent Kalanago homeland alongside French and English plantations and other islands. And it's only two centuries later, at the end of the 18th century, where the British finally destroy the Kalanago. They 
deport them, uh, 5,000 surviving from a population of over 100,000. They deport them to a single island off the coast of Honduras in Central America. It's a tragic story, but that process takes two centuries, and there's a remarkable treaty that the English sign with the indigenous Kalanago. The English don't tend to sign treaties with indigenous people in the Americas. And it's essentially a treaty of parity between the English and the Kalanago. Um, and actually, it's probably more favorable to the Kalanago than the English. Uh, the Kalanago would raid English slave plantations, liberate the enslaved people. Um, and so we have this in the heart of English empire, European colonialism, the horrors of slavery. There's indigenous power fighting, resisting, and generally succeeding for the better part of two centuries. And then if we cross uh, into the Indian Ocean, some of the earliest ventures of the English East India Company um, uh, were utter failures because they just could not adapt to the sophisticated commercial skills of the Javanese or the Chinese or the Japanese. You know, we, we heard in a, a panel, I think, Jay, you were on earlier in the festival, which everyone's forgotten about now, but um, you were saying that the English come to Asia and they, we've got nothing. We, we sell wool. Wool is our big export. Um, you know, and the people of, of the Indian nation are draped in, you know, sumptuous cotton textiles, uh, you know, gorgeous Japanese and Chinese silk. And we're like, do you want a woolly jumper? Um, and, and it doesn't, doesn't, the stuff rots and it goes. And, uh, and very quickly, the, the English become sort of the bottom feeders of the spice market in Indonesia. Um, and it's the Bantanese, it's the Javanese, it's the Chinese who have the monopoly. And they go to, go to, same thing, they go to Japan. Japan's full of silver. It's a rugged terrain, it's got mineral riches, and they hope to tap into that to fund their trade elsewhere. Um, and it's the same story. They can't access the Chinese goods required for the Japanese market. And in about 15 years, the English are kind of driven out. The Tokugawa shogun has become very powerful. It's centralized power in the country. Um, it, it's fighting back against the corrosive spread of European influence. It bans Christianity. Um, it executes Christians and converts. And eventually it makes it impossible for the English and the Dutch to operate. Uh, and so the English and Dutch do what they always do. They go, okay, we can't do this legally. We'll turn pirates. And they rampage around East Asia, capturing the ships. The uh, shogun confiscates the ships, strips them of its wealth, and returns the English a kind of empty hull. And there you go, well done. Uh, and so the English are up and out. And so there are a few success stories early in this period. And into the uh, later 17th and early 18th century, obviously, one success story, commercially speaking, is, is India. We, you know, that's something, obviously, William Dalrymple's work and, uh, uh, and others, uh, we were going to hear from Phil Stern, but sadly he couldn't be with us, um, have focused on the idea that this was the big success story. Nandini Das released a, a fantastic book, Courting India. Um, I'm not saying it's better than my book. They're both good. Um, choose wisely. And um, it's the way in which the English, from their positions of weakness, finally learn to adapt and to be subordinate. And they see these mighty empires, these rich economies. You know, England is, I think, Jerry, you described it, a drab, kind of rainy, excuse me, uh, island off the northwest coast of Europe. No one cares. Um, and it's drawn to Asia for its wealth. And that's not the usual Victorian narrative we've got. We, you know, we came to India to enlighten people, you know, to spread technology. Absolutely not. It's you know, very much bottom feeders, and it's learning to adapt. And, and it's really through that weakness of being suppliant to the Mughals. But even with the decline of the Mughal Empire in the 18th century, um, the East India Company struggles against, I think, more kind of successful Indian powers, like the Marathas, for example. The Maratha Confederacy is far more successful in expanding up into North India. And there's kind of a race following the English conquest of Bengal up the Gangetic Plain to secure Delhi and the puppet emperor. And it's the, it's the Marathas that, that win that. And it's only later in the 19th century where the East India Company tips the balance against it. So the early modern world, this kind of pre-19th century world, indigenous and non-European people are at the hierarchy of power and wealth. And it's the English that struggle. They've got 300 years, and really, they don't have much to show for it. Um, and I think the, the way we can think about the British Empire, and I'll finish up now, I don't want to overclip Shashi, you know, that's, that's rude. But it's, it's like... What we look at those maps of imperial pink spread around the world, it looks impressive. Um, but really, I think that says more that the British Empire is a compromise between what Britain tried to achieve, what it wanted to do, and the indigenous and non-European power that confronted it, and in many respects, reshaped it. Thank you, David. Um, do you have anything bad to say? About mm. I don't know. They produce great authors, the British Isles, I'll say that. <laughs> great authors. 
Shashi, can we talk about the Inglorious Empire? I mean, thinking about how you've written about this as well, and I guess sort of your own position, and, and I guess spinning off some of the things that David's been saying about That's opposition right. to empire. Shashi. Sure. I mean, the thing is that I, uh, we all wanted to read David's book, I'm sure, but I didn't get a copy in time. In fact, I haven't got one yet, so uh, there it is. <laughs> Too late to go through that now. But listening to David, and he would helpfully sent up a short few lines summary, I, I get a sense of, of what the book's about. And there has been, indeed, um, defiance of the British Empire uh, while it was being established in, in all the places he talks about, including in India. And my focus, of course, was on India uh, in the book that is known here as an era of darkness and in, in the rest of the world as inglorious empire. But what I tried to do was to talk about the entire uh, expansion of the British across India, and I entirely agreed that their motives were totally pecuniary. They first came to trade, indeed, the first British ambassador at the court of uh, Jahangir, 1614, Sir Thomas Rowe, was very much a supplicant. They were trying somehow to get a foot in the door of this incredibly prosperous empire. They weren't, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore they needed to be able to trade with India. And for about 150 years, that was the case. In fact, 1702, um, the, uh, Thomas Pitt, who was governor, quote-unquote, of Madras, which at that point was just the city of Madras, uh, purloined uh, a, a, a precious stone from a temple. I believe it was a, a ruby. And the moment he successfully shipped it back to England, uh, he could essentially afford to retire. It made him one of the richest men in the country, just one ruby. He was able to buy himself a rotten borough, buy himself uh, a seat in parliament, and at the same time, spawn a dynasty that gave Britain two prime ministers later in the century out of one Madras ruby. So, I mean, the wealth that was available in India was out of all proportion uh, to, to, to the needs of the somewhat impoverished, uh, grey, dank island off the coast of England. We're giving you English weather just to make you two feel at home, but, there's <laughs> but the truth is that... Uh, that, 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 was the, that was how it began. But I will probably defer slightly from David in one thing, and that it's not all a tale of defiance. And in fact, in many ways, the story of British expansion in India is a combination of episodes of defiance and long periods of complicity on the part of the colonized. That is, that we Indians played our part in enabling British expansion, going right back to the the first significant conquest of the British, which followed the Battle of Plassey, when they were able to consolidate their hold on, on, on Bengal. That was entirely financed by the Jagat Sits, uh, who were essentially Indian moneylenders. It is said that they actually controlled as much money as the Bank of England at its peak, in terms of relevant exchange rates at that time. They were very, very wealthy. They used to finance and bankroll armies and nabobs and so on. And financing the East India Company is what enabled them to actually defeat Siraj ud uh, in the Battle of Plassey and begin establishing their, their empire. Of course, once they'd done that, they were also very good uh, at, uh, at looting every place they conquered. And um, uh, there's one notorious episode where Clive marches into the treasury of one of the minor principalities he's overcome, is dazzled by all the jewels and gold and so on available, and then later marvels at his own self-restraint at not having stolen even more than he did. I mean, that was the way in which he did it. There's a, a letter I found, in my, uh, which I've quoted in my book, from a young man writing to his father in the middle of the 18th century, saying that there is no place in the world for an Englishman of no particular talent or distinction to make himself a fortune, like India, working for the East India Company. So that's how it was, and I must say it continued well into the 20th century. There's a, a deposition uh, in the House of Commons that I've come across by the then Foreign Secretary in the 1920s, saying there's all the scant about uh, us being there on a civilizing mission for the good of the natives. He said, this is utter twaddle. We are there. We, we seized India by the sword, and we rule it by the yardstick, and we will continue to do so as long as we can in our interest. So let's have no illusions about this. The civilizing mission came uh, as, a, as an ex post facto justification after the greatest uh, or best known act of Indian defiance, which was the great Indian revolt of 1857, that the British tried to disparage as the mutiny, the Sepoy mutiny. It was much more than a mutiny. It was a, a fairly substantial insurrection right across uh, large chunks of, of India, but it was put down with ruthlessness and ferocity. 
One particular day, 100,000 civilians were, were killed by the British in Delhi alone. Uh, and the numbers were bad enough, but the manner of their execution was particularly grisly. That's neither here nor there. What's happened has happened. But I'm just saying that after that big act of defiance, the British very quickly reasserted themselves, got rid of the East India Company, which in any case was largely a fiction. When the British say the British Empire only began in 1858, until then it was just a company. That's nonsense because the company, 26% uh, of the British Parliament owned shares in the East India Company. And the company didn't even appoint a governor general without clearing the name through the, uh, through the rulers of the day, whether they were prime minister or the, or, the, or the monarch. So it was very much a British colonial enterprise from the start. Uh, and that particular enterprise then uh, sought to justify itself in the language of the quote-unquote civilizing mission. Uh, the enlightenment to the benighted masses uh, of India. Uh, mind you, as I've chronicled in the book, the British created and presided over a large number of unnecessary famines that took at least 35 million Indian lives unnecessarily. Uh, we can talk about that if you're interested. And nonetheless, unfortunately, uh, Indians were complicit at various levels of the system. Whether it was in serving the British, in fact, Stalin expressed some astonishment and contempt at the fact that so few Englishmen could rule over 300 million people when, when he was making that comment. Because I think at the peak, I don't think Britain ever had more than 130,000 Britons in service in England, in India at any one time to rule over a population that at the time they left was about 330 million. So we had to cooperate in our own subjugation. And that's something that remains um, a, a blot on our story of defiance and resistance, if you like. Now, there were various bits of revolts and, 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 and so on throughout, but uh, I just wanted to add that, that corrective because I don't think we have a totally glorious record as the subjugated to point to, uh, even if subsequently, of course, uh, we did finally get rid, our, rid of the imperial yoke. So can I ask you both, I know you want to come back, so maybe you can respond initially, about the regional difference. So David, you started talking about the different implementations of British imperial power across the globe, and what you've just told us gives us a very specific engagement with the Indian situation. Just put that into a global context. What's singular and exceptional about the way in which British imperial power works here in India, which is different from the rest of the globe? Okay, do you mind? Do you... Um, uh, th that was great. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, it, w what's really fascinating is that there's so much overlap with what's going on elsewhere. The British, you know, these, these, these strategies that they perfect in India uh, have been in kind of long gestation. They've been trying them out all the way as far as back as Ireland. But you can see these kind of strategies that are deployed in Ireland is the first place where the English experiment with plantations, uh, which exclude uh, Catholic Irish people, uh, and they import uh, Protestant English and Scots and Welsh from, from, uh, from Britain. And then you see those plantations then established in places like Virginia and the Caribbean, but with enslaved labor uh, from West Africa. Um, and so uh, it's interesting because they essentially use what works. Um, and the biggest theme throughout of this, certainly in the pre-modern period, not necessarily in the 19th, 20th century, is that uh, England, the English state, in the 18th century with the British state, with the Union of Scotland and England, it's slightly more powerful. But they're of, often operating for a place of weakness. So that power imbalance often leads them to find elites within indigenous societies, within non-European cultures that will work with them. Um, and um, sometimes willingly, some, sometimes, you know, uh, indirectly, not knowing the eventual result, which will be an English takeover. And so the first thing they do, uh, in, one of the first things they do in Virginia is they, they you know, there's a famous story of the marriage of Pocahontas to, to, to John Roth, which forever we thought was a romantic story you may have seen in the Disney film. You know, actually it's a, a poor girl abducted and essentially forced to a marriage and probably, you know, sexually assaulted. Um, and, and this cemented the alliance between the Powhatans and, uh, and the English. So these tactics aren't new. And so when they come to India, they've been creating these cross-alliance networks as a way to empower themselves, to draw on the strength and wealth of indigenous elites and to participate in those political systems. You often have English East India Company servants being also appointed, not just part of the company, but they become a tax collector for the Golconda Sultanate, for example. Or, or you know, we speak about the conquest of Bengal, 
all, but you know, these were Mughal offices that the English were, were acquiring, you know, the Diwani, the, the Diwani rights to collect revenue in Bengal. It's a veneer of legitimacy and it's an imperial act, but there's an attempt somehow to appropriate these systems, not always just to destroy. Yeah, well, I mean, there's no question that the British were particularly adept to this, and frankly, some of the tactics used um, uh, you know, uh, would have done the mafia proud. I mean, uh, 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 Clive, as a young man, used to throw stones at, uh, at, at the glass store windows of, 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 of bakers and so Red on. Flag. And, Red flag. And tell them that uh, uh, if they wanted their glass to be protected, they'd have to pay him off. And he tried exactly the same technique in India. So he would march in to a particular place and tell the somewhat confused Maharaja or, or Raja or Nawab or whoever uh, in the, on the spot, listen, we think you need uh, to have a whole contingent of our soldiers here for your protection. And the guy would say, but who do I need protection against? And Clive would say, from me. So, I mean, I, either you pay up and you, this is the sum you're going to pay to billet these people here and feed them and look after them and, and the fee you pay me, or, you know, I'm afraid you're, you're really up for it. And, and the Maharajas would usually cave because the British did have a better artillery and better military equipment. And there was case after case like this. It, it was an extraordinary sort of shakedown kind of period, of the, those early decades of British expansion. But it was always animated by, by loot. And as, I, as you know, in my book, my principal objection uh, to British rule by comparison with all the other uh, uh, marauders and, and, and conquerors and so on had come and gone, was that the British ruled solely in their own self-interest that they were draining resources from India and sending it back to Britain. At least the other guys, uh, even if they exploited or they overtaxed or they did whatever, they would spend the money in India uh, on themselves perhaps, but also on fineries, and that ended up supporting artisans and jewelers and goldsmiths in India. Whereas, you know, the money that was being sent off, siphoned off by the Brits, might have paid for fashion retailers in Paris, but it wasn't helping anybody <laughs> in India. So all of these things became, uh, for, for me, matters of grave concern, and, and, and that's one of the things that I pointed out about the nature of the British imperial experience here. Yeah. Yeah. But there was, uh, as you rightly say, defiance in other places, not all of it particularly well motivated. I mean, West Africa, for example, I imagine that if the Dahomey kings were able to assert themselves against the Brits, um, it wasn't particularly pleasant for the slaves, whether they were being sold by a black ruler or a white one, yeah. uh, because the slaves were still being shipped off to, to work in the... Uh, plantations in the Caribbean and so on. So not all defiance was virtuous. No, no, no absolutely not. I mean, the, a good example, even in India, if you look at the Marathas, for example, who themselves could act like that and, and raid for chorth and force people to pay protection racket. Once they conquered those places, they invested, they settled down the administration. There's a French, um, a, a French uh, chronicler who says, uh, when you cross uh, from the disorder and disarray of British Bengal into the territories of the Marathas in places like Orissa, uh, it's, it's a tranquility, it's prosperous, the people are happy. So there's an initial period of conquest, but with the settlement of Maratha rule, there's a, an attempt to invest, to restore, to bring stability. The British territories are in constant chaos, are in constant war, being stripped of their resources to fund the East India Company, um, with almost absolutely no budgets for you know, education, healthcare. Yeah, and one of the first consequences of the British conquest of Bengal was the Great Bengal Famine of 1770 to 1776, when one third of the entire population died. Because in the past, when there'd been droughts or, or bad weather and there wasn't enough, immediately the system organized itself around charity. Uh, so that even the Maharajas would waive taxes uh, up until the drought was over. They would, they would uh, sort of hand out free grain to people and that sort of thing. Whereas the Brits insisted on doing everything by the book, by the rules. So you have to give this much of tax. It doesn't matter how badly you're suffering, whether you can't eat or not. Mm -hmm. And the British would also buy up grain or, or take the grain mm -hmm. uh, and ship it back to England at a time when there was not enough grain for people to eat in Bengal. Can you imagine one third of the entire population of the province of Bengal died between 1770 and 1776? That's the kind of thing that was going on. And even the Nawabs had kept up uh, grain storage for in times of famine, which the British allowed to kind of fall into disrepair. And even at the time when they're being made aware of the outbreak of famine, they increased the land tax by 10%. That's and right. it's that kind of, uh, okay, famine may not always be man-made, but colonial extraction exasperates and makes it a lot worse than it was. And in the late Victorian era, I know that's probably after your period of what you're writing about, but I mean, when they had uh, 
suddenly a, a burst of conscience because there was by then a mass media and the public were a bit uh, conscious of what the British were trying to do in foreign countries. Uh, they decided to create uh, some sort of quote-unquote relief camps during famines. But as has been pointed out by Mike Davies in his book, Late Victorian Holocaust, the rations provided to the Indians in these camps in exchange for work. No one was given anything for free because that would have been offensive to the British ideals of, of, of work ethic and so on. Mm -hmm. The rations given were less than those supplied by the Nazis in Buchenwald to the Germans, to the Jews they were about to gas. So that's the kind of condition that Indians had to endure uh, under British rule. We but, the, but the trains, the trains though, no, no. Oh, yeah, right. the trains of course were built in order to extract resources from our country, ship them off the ports to be sent to you. <laughs> so there we are. There is a version here, though. If we were doing this in the UK, it's, it's important to say to this audience that we would, you know, there's a sort of, there's a consensus here about a version of empire, um, and both, both the speakers here are taking slightly different positions, but there's a certain consensus about our belief about empire. If we're in the UK, there'd be a debate here, and we could have had very different speakers on who would challenge this position and talk about, you know, the benefits of empire. This is partly what's going on in the UK. So I do want to ask both of you, and then I want to open it up, because I think it'll be very interesting to throw it out to you. What do we do now as educators, as politicians, about thinking about the legacy of empire? We talk about decolonizing history. Um, where do we go with this? How do we make that challenge around a neoliberal position which is buying back into empire? So what do we do to, to keep this work going? Where do we go now once we're starting to unpick these histories? Shashi. Well, I, I, I have a very clear view on this, uh, which I've, I've now articulated many times, so forgive me for repeating myself to some of you here. And that is, I believe that we have to forgive, but we should not forget. And that in, that's from our point of view in India. And from the Brits, I think that what would be very, very helpful would be three kinds of acts of atonement. The first is quite simply an apology, which the British have never found it possible to give. I mean, the Archbishop of Canterbury, poor man, came and sprawled on the floor at Jallianwala Bagh, but we've never seen either a British government official or, or, a, um, or a member of the royal family, because after all, everything was done in the name of the crown. When poor old Meghan Markle was still there, they could have sent her to come and apologize, but somebody could have apologized. That's number one. Um, number two, I would say, would be to teach unvarnished colonial history in British schools. Uh, it was possible when I published Inglorious Empire, I discovered that you could actually get an A-level in history without learning one line about British, Britain's colonial uh, adventure. It was all about you know, beating Napoleon of the, war, the Battle of Waterloo and the redoubtable uh, heroes of freedom and democracy. Nothing about what they did to the colonized people. And the third thing that would be helpful, I, I, I've often joked that all the museums of London are essentially chor bazaars because they are, they are full, of, full of objects purloined from the colonies. But it is a great city for museums, uh, and yet there is no museum to colonialism. There is the Imperial War Museum, which celebrates the great military triumphs of British imperialism. Nothing talking about the experience uh, of imperialism from the point of view of the colonized, or even depicting their reality uh, in, in all its, in all its, its. so mm. I would say that if, if some good English people could get together, I did meet a lady once in London who came up to me and said that she was trying to get some English people together to do this, but some years have gone by and I've not seen anything in the newspapers about a great London museum to colonialism. I think those are three ways in which, honestly, Britain could show some moral atonement for these 200 years. Instead, we have this kind of breathtaking uh, ignorance about everything. YouGov did a poll the year I published my book in which 59% of the people surveyed said that they were proud of the empire and would love to have it back. Uh, we've, had, um, we've had a British politician talking about empire 2.0 after Brexit. Well, given how bad an idea 1.0 was, I'm astonished that they're prepared to con contemplate 2.0. And, and we've had a British um, uh, uh, Home Secretary, I think it was, or certainly a senior minister, actually saying with astonishing effrontery to the world media that Britain was the one country in Europe that had nothing to be ashamed of in its record in the 20th century. And I thought, my God, Jallianwala Bagh happened in the 20th century, for God's sake. You, you shot and killed, by your own admission, 1379, innocent men, women, and children. 
And, and, and you're talking about having nothing to be ashamed of? I mean, it really, so atonement is required. A certain uh, awakening of conscience is essential, in my view. And that's, that would be the, leg, the way to reckon with the legacy. David, and then what I'd like to open it up. David? I'll speak to Rishi. I'll speak to Rishi. He's a friend. Don't want an apology from him. No, He's a friend. Do that. No. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I, I can only ag uh, agree with all that, and I'll, I'll leave Shashi's far more uh, eloquent in, in talking about that. I mean, but I, I, I think particularly important is education. Um, I mean, I've been an educator in the UK now for about 13, 14 years, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most offensive questions that students between the age of 16 and 18 in the UK have to sit uh, A-levels at college. Uh, and, a, and on the single British Empire paper that students can choose, uh, the question is, uh, was British rule in India more beneficial than it was harmful? And so the, that forces students to learn a balance sheet view of empire that inevitably forces them to consider that there is always good and bad, and that those two things are nuanced. It's complex. There are always good and bad things. Um, and so you've got famine. We'll put that under the bad column. But cricket. So there's like... England that's not going too well one, today. I was just checking. So I probably should have mentioned the cricket. Sorry, that was bad. But, uh, and, 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 but that forces to us to teach students with a framework that, um, you, know, you know, there are certain things in history that you don't, uh, you don't approach with a balance sheet. But David, you have yeah. to admit that there was not one thing of all the so-called good things, railways, cricket, the courts, the English language, not one thing that the British brought to India because they intended to do any good to the Indians. Every yeah. single one of them was in the self-interest of Britain and to perpetuate British yeah, rule. Yeah. And, and I've explained this at some length in my book, so if you haven't read it, please do, because that's precisely the problem. Yeah. Even cricket, bless yeah, its soul. Course, yeah. uh, the British really wanted to play amongst themselves. They didn't have enough people to run around and pick up the ball and so on, so they yeah. taught some Indians. But <laughs> Indians had to really make the effort to learn the oh, game steady, themselves. Steady, steady. OK, <laughs> I think I'd really like to open it up. Yeah, uh, we've got mics. Hands up everywhere, mics, go around, uh, guy in the red. Uh, and yeah. the reason oh, Indians learned Europe. the game was precisely to beat the British at it. Um, another question <laughs> behind, got another Words mic? Hurt. Hurt. Words hurt. Where's the mic? Hi, mic? I'm audible. Yeah, I'm Pranav well, Krishna. Get, get, where's the mic? I had two quick questions yeah. for both the panelists. Brown, um, brown sweater has the mic. Yes. Uh, firstly, how do you reconcile an uh, Indian being the prime minister of the UK and still using anti, I mean, colonial rhetoric, using saying stuff that they would never give reparations for the slave trade perpetuated by colonial powers, using highly anti-immigration policies and whatnot, right? That seems something particularly disturbing to me. And number two, to more to Dr. Shashi Tharoor, how do you reconcile the fact that the colonial right. disintegration of matrilineal systems in Kerala itself has still not revived. It's the only kinship system in the world to be completely abolished and not to exist at all. Can I take the first one, Shashi? Is that okay? I, I, the, 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 what you have to understand about Britain apologizing, which of course it should, and Britain making reparations, which of course it should, is that word, and the thing about the legacy of empire, especially in the UK, is it's fundamentally entwined with our political and cultural identity. And so we would have to admit that a large part of our history and contemporary British society was shaped and formed in the crucible of colonialism. And a lot of people in the UK can't do that, they, uh, because it's bound up with their sense of identity. So the idea of shedding uh, an honest historical light on what the British did in India, what the British did in the transatlantic slave trade, would be having to admit that, that uh, British history is not just one of triumph and fighting the Nazis, that actually imperialism is a system of coercion, control and exploitation, and that's in, in our DNA. And so, in a way, you'd have to burn the whole thing down to do that. And then, why not burn it all down and start again? That's not well, a call I, for revolution. I, I think, Don't. you know, Rishi Sunak may be of Indian extraction, but he's still the Prime Minister of Britain. And he's going to yeah, follow yeah. the policies yeah, yeah. that are made possible for him by his party and by his government. Uh, the fact that he looks the way he does is a result of one... Uh, very simple fact, which was brilliantly illustrated in a photograph I saw of a bunch of brown and black protesters outside the House of Parliament, which said they're holding up a placard saying, we are here because you were there. I think that kind of sums it up. Yeah. Great. Question there, and then a lady at the yeah. back there. Yeah? Go. Uh, most welcome, Mr. Tharoor, uh, to Jaipur. Thank Model you. First. 
I am uh, Rohita Sharan with my friend Ramnias Chaudhary. I want to ask your opinion with respect to Indians' demeanor during the British colonial era and now um, being an Indian president, uh, prime minister there, uh, dogs and Indians were not allowed. That's right. So what is your take on this? And then India has taken over uh, as number fifth in the world as economic, economic uh, global partner and we are the fifth largest economy. How have we, you know, uh, overtaken the Britain and other countries? Your personal views on the same? Well, I mean, I, I think the first one, obviously, was a different time. And yes, the British were racist while they were here. There's no question about that. Uh, the so-called civil lines were for the white folks and the black town was for the Indians. And, and there were clubs in which, in fact, I've written the story of one of the first ICS officers uh, who ended up committing suicide because he simply couldn't get admission to any of the whites only clubs at which the real decisions were being taken. And he had this sort of Nam Kivaste title of ICS, but no real power or no real authority, and he went and killed himself. Uh, and this is a true story from the 1880s. So I'm just saying that you, you're looking at a situation where in that era there was that kind of behavior, but undoubtedly Britain has changed. Not that Rishi Sunak would have become prime minister in ordinary circumstances. I have met Rishi Sunak, I'm very impressed by him, as he's an intellect, he's a smart man. But it was a particular set of circumstances that made it possible. And also a particular method with the, only the MPs voted for somebody who could manage the economy rather than have a general vote of, vote of the Conservative Party, which he had lost the previous time to Lynn Trust. So you have to understand it's a complicated business. He was there to be a competent economic manager, and that's it. I don't think one can extrapolate too much more uh, from his appointment than that. I don't think that's gone too well, actually, but... <laughs> The consensus has cracked uh, sorry, on stage. There is somebody there and another lady there. One, two. You've got the mics. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Anya. I had a question for Mr. David. Um, Thank so you, because I think I've left both these questions only half answered. <laughs> but we are, we are tight for time. Go ahead. Um, so as a British citizen yourself, what led you to um, delve into the horrors of your own nation and um, <laughs> educate students on that? Because I'm under the impression that British students or British people don't know much about what their nation has done. So what led you to go out of your way to research into that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the education. I think that uh, a lot of uh, people that either refuse to confront the horrors of colonialism or deny it and suggest that colonialism is a force. But it, it generally comes from ignorance, not knowing about the subject. So, uh, you know, actually I came to study the British Empire through a position of, <gasps> wow, isn't that a triumphant history? Isn't it glorious? Like a boy's own kind of these adventurous episodes. And actually it doesn't take very long to study the period of colonialism. And especially when you get in the archives and you see a letter of a Royal Navy ship captain in the mid-18th century in the Atlantic describing another British captain killing a four-year-old girl from West Africa for crying too much after she'd been kidnapped and sent into slavery. So I am aghast at historians that study colonialism and are not, to an extent, radicalised by the horrors of, of colonialism. And for me, you have to question those people as being like virtually sociopathic. You need to get into the archives, you need to study the great uh, post-colonial scholars, and it does not take long for you to understand that most of it's propaganda, and it's just a horrible system of control, coercion, exploitation that didn't give birth to the modern world, but rather ruined the world we had before this. No. Okay, yeah, great. Um, Three men on stage, yeah. so it's time to have all the women speaking. So there's a lady there and there's a lady at the back there. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. And I'm, I can't help but wonder that, say, around 30, 40 years ago, we wouldn't have this conversation with two of you sitting, three of you sitting, in fact. And, on an, and with such mature angle to the whole situation. So thank you for that. But on the lighter note, where did all that money go, David? I mean, if you guys I, looted I didn't, us. I, I didn't take it. I didn't take it. I took it. <laughs> but uh, who took it? I, I mean, drive a second-hand Nissan. No, I didn't take it. I even even it. in the 1790s, I've quoted uh, uh, the writer Hugh Walpole taking a carriage down one of the streets and identifying mansion after mansion built with Indian money. Uh, a lot of money just went into things like real estate and buildings and so on. And, and the overall prosperity. They went into the factories of Dundee. They went into jute mills. They went into textile mills. They, they went into financing a lot of stuff. Yeah. 
uh, the lifestyles of the rich and famous in, in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries mm -hmm. were essentially financed from colonial loot. Uh, Lloyd's, Lloyd's Insurance, the largest insurance in the world, was founded in a coffee shop amongst merchants thinking about how they can insure ships in the transatlantic slave trade, the ships engaging in the trade to Asia. So, you know, the, the major financial institutions that underwrite Western power and economic hegemony, which, you know, obviously we're seeing in decline, um, it's all invested in, in and, and that the lifestyle we enjoy today in the West is almost always underwritten by the profits that were so, so you mean to tell me I mean in after 1947 the money just finished Oh, no, 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 um, no, absolutely not. There's been a fantastic book uh, uh, written recently uh, on the Commonwealth and the way in which this is a transition. You know, you have to remember it was the British Commonwealth for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you, you know, and uh, it, it, not necessarily in India, but in a lot of the countries which uh, achieve independence from Britain, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, political system and the political elites who are handed power are those that can ensure... British, French, Portuguese financial interests. So, you know, something uh, astounding I found today in West Africa that France, you know, still maintains uh, a shocking share uh, in financial institutions in those countries, wow. even though it has no political status. Wow. So, you know, political unions, Commonwealth, I know, Jay, but, you know, these are all preserving, you know, post colonial influence in a massive way. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah, the own Commonwealth. Can we just have one yeah. more question here? Thank you so much. Uh, my question is for Dr. Tharoor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, sir. Your work is greatly appreciated. Um, I uh, couldn't help but notice a thread from one of your earlier sessions today where I was attending, where you said that a democracy is what happens in between the elections, where we are headed more towards an electoral autocracy, where we are being sh shepherded as sheep uh, by, she by a shepherd. Uh, and today in this session you said about the complicity of in Indians in, the, in their own subjugation. So do you see a thread, a parallel between what we did then and what's happening today? The, the bell just went. Uh, parallel, no. Similarity, arguably, because there is no question that if we are in a democratic election voting for people whose actual conduct towards us between elections we don't like, then we are complicit in who we are and where we end up. So, yes, I would say that the Indian electorate, including all those who don't bother to go and vote or don't even bother to register to vote, as many, many people in this audience are probably in that category, they do have only themselves to blame if they get a government they're not proud of. Yeah. Uh, that I leave it to all of you. Democracy, our country, is in your hands, just as our, it was in our hands when the Brits came and took it away from us. And with that, yeah, can we just carry on? Thank you, Shashi Tharoor. David Vivas, the book is here to sign. Buy the book. It's a good book. Okay. Only 700 rupees, sister still. Thank you. <laughs>